Hermione Lee is a biographer, critic, and teacher of literature. Her books include the internationally acclaimed biography of Virginia Woolf and Edith Wharton, as well as Penelope Fitzgerald, and most recently, Tom Stoppard. She's also written books on Elizabeth Bowen, Willa Cather, and Philip Roth. Her collections of essays on life writing include biography, a very short introduction, which we're going to riff off today. She was, until recently, the president of Wilson College. She was made a Dane for Services to Literary Scholarship in 2013. She lives in Oxford and Yorkshire. It's just Oxford now, Alice. Just Oxford now. You're not splitting yourself up. No, not anymore. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. Why have you decided to spend your entire life researching and writing about literary lives? Well, I I come out of a intense literary childhood. Um, I can't remember a time when the main thing in my life wasn't reading books. Um, I read English at Oxford. I've always been absorbed in mainly fiction, but also poetry and drama and non-fiction. And I've always been, since I can remember, deeply fascinated by how books get put together and what kinds of people do that work. And so I suppose it's simply been a sort of lifelong obsession. I'm not exactly sure how I how it sort of came about that I became a literary biographer, because you don't, as it were, pass an exam to be a literary biographer. You don't you don't audition for the role and you don't get any training in it. You sort of just evolve into that kind of writing, I think. It's interesting, isn't it? Like why you're so interested in books. It's it's difficult to get to the very root of that, isn't it? Yes, I think it is. And, and of course, we both uh, read a lot about, I'm sure you do as much as I do, read a lot about other people talking about why they have particular fascination with books and how their childhood reading came to affect their adult lives. I don't think it's just escapism. I don't think it's just a sort of unwillingness to face up to the world as it is. I think it's a deep source of lifeblood and magic and absorption in stories. And I think it's also to do with curiosity, curiosity about how other life stories have been shaped and what the endless possibilities of storytelling are. And it's, yeah, it's hard to find the deepest roots in that. I know there are people who don't read books and who have perfectly satisfactory lives, <laughs> you know? And, yeah. it, and one can't say, how could you read your life without reading books? I mean, I know, for instance, I'm, I'm very fond of and interested in music, and I listen to music a lot, and I'm very interested in the theatre, uh, which is another kind of writing altogether, and I like going for walks in the open air and looking at my garden and doing stuff there. But I'm perfectly at ease with the notion that there are people who don't want to read books. They want to garden or they want to make bread or, you know, yeah. I, I do I do think it is a kind of peculiarity. And, and I, I suppose it is a sort of minority interest yes. increasingly because so much of our world now is visual and not literary. I think one of the other things, too, is that books are where you can get deep thinking about things and you can really grip onto some interesting ideas in in a way that you can't elsewhere. Yes. And it's interesting as a teacher, I, I've retired now. I'm I'm not teaching students anymore or looking after graduate students theses, but it always struck me that. A a, a tutorial or a seminar uh, with a group of people reading, I don't know, Conrad or Scott Fitzgerald or Willa Cather for the first time in their lives was the only place in your life where you would actually talk concentratedly and intensively about a book (laughs) or a group of books for an hour or two hours. When else in your life 
unless you're a member of the book club, you get to do that. And that's a, that's a very extraordinary privilege in life and also a very fascinating operation. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess we just do it because it turns us on. It, it, we, it, we like it, obviously. Or, or uh, to put it more strongly, we can't live without it. Yeah, okay. So what I want to get to is what you do, <laughs> Uh, how you do it and and why you do it. So uh, in the book that we, I reference, the, the very short uh, introduction to biography, you talk about two uh, metaphors, autopsy and portrait. Perhaps you could just look at both of those uh, for us quickly. Yes, I, I, I think I started the book. It's quite a while since I wrote that book, but I think I started the book trying to think of the the fundamental contradiction in biography, and that's and this isn't just literary biography, although that's what I do, um, which is that on the one hand, it is investigative, intrusive, forensic, analytical. It's trying to sort out truth from falsity. It's trying to sort out actual history from rumour and myth-making. It's trying to delve into all the different versions of a life in order to tell the most accurate possible story. And in that sense, it's got a kind of rather chilling association with autopsy. You are cutting up the body in order to try and find, you know, how it, how it worked and what the diseases were and so You can't talk to the body, can you? <laughs> well, no, that's the difference between writing... You can talk with, at it. With, that's the difference between writing the life of a dead person and a living person. Yes. And in, in many... Well, we'll come back to that, I'm sure. In many ways, there are advantages of dealing with a dead person because they can't talk back, as it were. Right. But there are also disadvantages. And then the opposite, as it were, of the autopsy is the portrait, whereby... Even if, of, as as Samuel Johnson and Boswell, his biographer, were always saying, it ought to be warts and all, you know, there shouldn't be flattery, there shouldn't be smoothing over. The portrait should be a realistic one, like a Dutch portrait, you know, like a like like a Rembrandt portrait, where you see the the bunions and the scars and the, the marks of time and so on. Nevertheless, a portrait is something which is trying to refill the subject with life give life back if it is a dead subject give life back to a dead subject put put warmth and color and life and feeling into the version that you're giving of the person so that's in a sense the diametric opposite of the idea of the autopsy and the peculiar thing about biography is that it does a number of different things at once, or it should do a number of different things at once if it's going to work. And and those two, are, it seems to me anyway, to be at the heart of the two different things that it does at once. Yes, it's in in effect, it's one is observing the truth as you're able to determine it, and the other is it is an art. It's creative. It's uh, using your skill in representation. It's certainly a craft. I mean, Virginia Woolf, who wrote a lot about this and was extremely suspicious of biography, talked quite a lot about whether you should describe it as an art or a craft. And of course, there's a lot of there's a lot of dogged spade digging work that you do with biography. There's a lot of, there, there are large aspects of it that aren't anything to do with art, it seems to me, in that it's not okay. inspirational or in some ways it's not you know, coming out of the sort of creative part of your mind, what you're doing a lot of the time is trying to organise your materials and dis- and decide what to put in and what to leave out and how to just, you know, turn the shape of a life into the shape of a book, which, of course, is an artificial thing to do. Yes, you're, you're making selections and choices, and there's all sorts of different ways to represent people, aren't there? I mean, yeah. I taught biography. Uh, I have a, uh, I founded a center for life writing at uh, Wilson College, where I was president for nine years, and I used before then to teach courses in in life writing, which is a sort of amalgam of biography and autobiography. One of the things I used to do was to present the students or to get them to bring examples of maybe six different versions of the same person's life. 
So six different biographies of, of Dickens or Jane Austen or, you know, Oscar Wilde or whatever. And to look at a scene in that life, like maybe the birth or the death of the subject or a particular crisis, which everybody always writes about in the subject's life, like the scene in Jane Austen's life where her parents tell her she's going to move house and go and live in Bath and she faints or she's supposed to have fainted. It's absolutely fascinating, actually, to see the completely different ways in which different biographers will tell that factual story and draw yes. on, draw on the, the sources in different ways. So I'm very, very interested in the different ways in which people can tell. And Wolf is a very interesting case in point. There are many, many different lives of Wolf and many different versions of her mental illness and you know her suicide and so on. Well, isn't that just really what the reader should do? Is There's no such thing, as you say, as a definitive life. There's a whole variety of different ways of looking at it. And I suppose if you're interested in that person, you go out and you, you uh, read as many different versions as you can to mm. get a better picture, I guess. It's interesting what you said about definitive. I mean, people, publishers use this all the time, as you yes. know, and people will constantly... And, you know, people will constantly say this is the definitive biography of someone. And yeah. I I very much dislike it. I don't much like authorised, but I know that if, for instance, when writing a life of Tom Stoppard, who's, who's thankfully alive, if you're asked to do it by the subject and you say yes, and they then give you materials, which is what happened, and they give you access, then you are, yes, you are obviously writing the authorised biography because you have been authorized to do it but that doesn't mean you're writing the definitive biography no no as you say it's really just a way of selling the book and i suppose each generation though i i guess it might be useful to have the definitive biography for your generation that's that's exactly right i mean i i still wouldn't want to use that adjective but there are certainly books about people that seem to absolutely speak to the time at which they're written and of course that's what we do as biographers I was very well aware when I was writing a life of Virginia Woolf which I began to work on in the early 90s I was coming out of a period where there had been an enormous amount in the 1980s about her clinical history about childhood sexual abuse about mental illness um and she's one of those writers like Sylvia Plath, who, when people are writing about her, they sort of pick up on the zeitgeist, you know, they pick up on what is being done in psychoanalysis, for instance, at the time, or what is happening in, in feminist movements and so on. And so she reflects and feeds back into those movements. And I very much wanted to kind of move away from what I considered to be a somewhat infantilizing version of Virginia Woolf, where she was treated very much in terms of illness, very much in terms of childhood trauma, and not so much in terms of the astonishing professional achievement, the astonishing yes. energy, the astonishing rigor of her professional writing life. So I'm very well aware that that was me at that point in time and that someone else coming on afterwards would do it differently. Well, you wanted to shake off the Freudian. I don't think you can ever, you can't pretend that Freud hasn't had an enormous, powerful effect on the way life stories are written. So, for instance, in the 19th, in the 18th and 19th century biographical examples, you can think of people weren't so particularly interested in childhoods. And of course, now you can't possibly write a biography of someone without talking about their childhood. And I think that's a good of Freudian analysis and the influence of Freud on psychoanalysis. Though I think the period in the early 20th century when people were writing full-on, no-holds-barred Freudian biography, now when you look back at it, it looks quite sort of crude and prescriptive, yeah. actually. Yeah, we've outgrown it, it seems. A bit. Or it's, yeah. or it's become more complicated. But pe it's interesting, people who aren't ostensibly using... Freudian tools, you very often will find them in the course of a biography using words like trauma. There's a truth to it, of course, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, Freud was brilliant. I mean, he, I think, uh, and in fact, I think he said at one point, 
that all of this psychoanalysis is, is fine, but as soon as we find the drugs that work, they'll put psychoanalysis out of business. There's a very good book by Adam Phillips, the um, the psychoanalyst and writer Adam Phillips, who has written a book on Freud, a short book on Freud, in which he has a brilliant account of Freud's hostility towards biography. Yes, yes, yes. Freud, as it were, would do him out of a job, you know. Yes, yeah. I'm just going to run through now quickly. You identify, even though you say there are no rules at the end of it, you do identify 10 rules. And they are, and I'm just going to quickly summarize them. Truth, cover the whole life. Don't omit anything or conceal anything. All sources should be identified. The biographer should know the subject area. They should be objective, quote unquote. It should be a form of history. It should be an investigation of identity. It should have value for the reader. And again, as I said, the very last rule is uh, that no such thing as a definitive biography. There are no rules. You want to add to that at all? I mean, there's a lot there. Obviously, I was trying, I suppose, to to summarize the many things that people say they think biography ought to do. When I was teaching classes on life writing, I would begin by saying to the students, OK, you're going into a bookshop and you're spending a lot of money on a large fat book. Usually, yeah. what do you expect from it? What do you think you should get for your money? And it's an, it's an interesting basic question because people would come up with some variety or other of the things that I express as sort of possible rules. And they would often say, I want, I want it to be true. I yeah. want it to tell everything. I want it to be as objective as possible. I think it should give me a historical context. I think it should give me a very strong sense of the person and so on. So those yeah. are all things yeah. that I put in as rules. But of course, some biographies don't or can't tell the whole truth because there isn't enough evidence you know if you're writing a biography of jesus you yeah. haven't got as much material as if you're writing a life of virginia Woolf. if you're writing a life of shakespeare which, of which there are many you have all yeah. kinds of problems about source material so to some most, degree you most of it's it conjecture up. Yeah, a lot exactly. of it's conjecture. And so then there's a whole interesting school where um, the figure of Stephen Greenblatt interestingly comes to mind. Yes, That's yes. very fascinating to me. These are very gripping narratives, but a lot of them are based on hypothesis, if you like, or conjecture. If this was going on at the time, then might we yeah. think that this was what was happening? I find yeah. it hard to do that, but then my subjects are much more recent in time. I have the privilege of working on late 19th, early 20th, 20th century figures, where there's usually, not always, but there's usually quite a lot of source material, sometimes too much. The thing about Greenblatt's uh, biography of Shakespeare, uh, so much of it was conjecture. And, and yet I learned a lot about the antagonism between the religions mm. and, you know, mm. the heads that were mm. on pikes going mm. across the bridge. I mean, that, yes. that is extraordinary. Heads uh, on pikes. That's another metaphor for biography, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah. I, th I think he's very brilliant and yeah. very compelling. Yeah. I'm very, yeah. I'm kind of leery of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm very fascinated by all that because I don't like to say this I hate this sort of, it must have been, or she might have felt, or he must have thought. All those yeah. basic tropes that people do in biography. If I had, was I going to add to my rules in that little book? I think I'd, I'd also don't do must have, should have, might have, would have, you know, try yes. to avoid the following. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things that I look for, yes, is is I don't I don't want a bunch of fiction. I want what happened. It's, it's sort of like watching a documentary on a figure as opposed to a, a fictionalized account. And yet, uh, now this is a Canadian author. His name is Mark Abley, and he wrote a, a biography of Canadian poets. But he was also an administrator of Canada's residential school system, which some have called genocidal. And what 
Mark did was he basically fictionalized the events that took place while he was thinking about that character. So that character actually shows up in his living room and they have conversations and debates and arguments about the character's future Mm -hmm. reputation and whether what he did was right or wrong. I thought that was fascinating. And as I say, I normally don't like this idea of fiction. It's it's been done before, hasn't it? And I'm just trying to think as you speak. I can't think of who it was. Somebody who wrote a big... Thinking um, of Reagan? Reagan? Yeah. It's, Dutch? That Dutch, that's right, Dutch. Where, yeah. yeah, where your subject shows up fictionally and talks to you. Interestingly, Peter Ackroyd did that in his big 1980s Life of Dickens. And it's it struck me then that you might be able to get away with it in literary biography in a way that it's much harder to do if you're writing about a political yeah. or, you know, a, social, a figure in society where it's surely incumbent on you not to make things up. Because partly the issues are so, in the case you've cited, the issues are so difficult and so fraught that, you know, you make things up at your peril. I think it's perfectly okay to have a sort of coda or an introduction to a biography where you allow yourself in and you talk about the difficulties of the task and you talk about the relationship between yourself and your subject. But I don't myself, I wouldn't myself want to put that in as the main narrative, as part of the main narrative, because I think partly it's what offend, what sort of worries me about it is that it's as if you're saying... I'm as important as the person I'm yes. writing about. I, yeah. I'm I'm just as interesting to the reader as the person I'm writing about. And you're not, you know, if if yeah. you are a biographer and you've written a book about Penelope Fitzgerald or Willa Cather or or Virginia Woolf or Edith Wharton or Tom Stoppard, the, re- the reader has gone into the bookshop or the library to get that book. Not because they're interested in you, although they might like the kind of biography you do, but because they're interested in your subject, you know, the hell with you. You should be talking about this other person. So I think there are issues about egotism there that that worry me a bit. Yes, so you're saying the biographer should be uh, humble or there should be a humility involved. Well, I hate the word humble because it's become such a faux word. But, I mean, people say I am very humbled by this. I usually not humble people. But I think the biography, the biographer should be practising a certain self-concealment or keeping themselves out of it. I do not think that biography can be objective. You do amass as many facts as you can. You do try to get it right. You do try not to make things up. But you are bound to be writing from the point of view of your race, your gender, your class, your education, your age, your century, and all the rest of it, you know, whether you're religious or not. I mean, one of the problems I have with my subjects is if they have a really strong friendship with someone that I find absolutely detestable, I have to keep saying to myself, it's not your friend, it's their friend. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I, for instance, really dislike the sound of Bernard Berenson, who was a fantastically good friend of Edith Wharton's and I think Berenson is such a terrible snob and probably a crook and you know I I really didn't like him but I had to kind of stop myself doing that because the important thing is not what you think about this person but what Edith Wharton felt about this person so yeah it's it's keeping yourself out of the picture while being aware that your your own prejudices are probably going to come into play somewhere And yet one of the greatest biographies is Boswell's Life of Johnson and Boswell's right there. And in fact, the best parts, I think, are the conversation that that they're so fantastic. And it it Mm. takes two to have a conversation. I love the fact that you've got this huge book, most of which is about the period of Johnson's life in which he knew Boswell. (laughs) Although, actually, if you look at the length of time, that's actually quite a small part of Johnson's life. Yes. The word word life writing comes in very useful when you're writing about that, when you're thinking about that book, for instance, which has this astonishing immortal life. I love that because it is so full of portraiture and, and character and life and vigor and energy. But 
it is both autobiography and biography. It isn't just straight biography. And it's also, no. as you say, yes. conversation and it's a travel journey and all the rest of it. It's a wonderful yeah. mixed bag. And biography, I think, is a very mixed bag. It's a mongrel form, as Richard Holmes used to say. Yeah. So what makes it so great? Uh, uh, how come you write such great biographies? Well, thank you. I, I, I'm resisting that as a kind of blanket <laughs> term. I think when it's when it works, it's got to be shaped so that you want to follow the story. It's and, and it's got to give enough sense of vivid, believable detail authentic detail so that you actually feel and that's why it can allow itself to be long but mm -hmm. gradually 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 you're sort of absorbing your sense of this person who you're interested in because of their work usually or because of what they've achieved so that by the end you feel you know that if the person walked into the room you would recognize them from this book and i i tend to use a lot of detail uh, I'm very keen on writing about the places that the people have lived in. I'm very keen on letting their voice echo through the book. So I will give enormous amounts of illustrations. And I'm also very keen on anecdotes. And uh, Elizabeth Gaskell famously said when she began her life of Charlotte Bronte, she put a little sticker, as it were, above her desk, which said, if you love your reader, get anecdotes. And that's right. I think you need story after story after story. So the reader needs to want to read it for the story, really. And that's what I've tried to do. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the thing is, too, is obviously, unless you were there taking down the conversation, you're not going to know what that those those conversations were. But if you can somehow say that you're replicating what you've found somehow and then convey a good conversation with a really smart funny person that's not much better way to spend time mm. Mm. and in you're at the mercy of what you can get and so boswell of course had the great advantage of being there uh, yeah. and apparent and all these funny funny stories about boswell rushing out of the room to write down what yeah. he yeah. rushing back yeah. in to pick up a bit more you know. uh, <laughs> Tom Stoppard and I had jokes about this you know when I was yeah. sort of <laughs> sitting in sitting yeah. in on rehearsal he'd see me sort of scribbling <laughs> away in the yes in fact uh, I'm not sure exactly where this comes from I think it's it's your observation on the the life of Johnson and that is the the dance of conversation mm. and co-partnership mm. can you explain that or do you remember that well I mean I think the life and vigor of that particular book which is not quite like any other biography that I can think of is that, that it is a form of exchange and that there is this sense of you know, you wonder sometimes whether Johnson wasn't a bit of a performing bear for Boswell, you know, whether he didn't, as it were, say things in Boswell's presence that were particularly Johnsonian, <laughs> because he, he knew that Boswell would write them down. You wonder about that, you know. That's a bit like reading people's letters. I mean, I'm very struck by reading Virginia Woolf's letters, for instance, who is one of the great letter writers and and very often very wicked yeah. and often very reprehensible. And you can see her performing, performing for the person that she's writing to. I'm very, very interested in performance, in life as performance and in the way in which people act differently with different people, write differently to different people and, you know, in a sort of Irving Goffman type, Wait, you know, perform their selves and have a somewhat different public life from their private life. And so, yeah, that's part of my interest also in theatre and in and in the work that Stoppard does, where he is much harder to pin him down in his work than it is to perhaps pin someone down in their novel writing, because a fiction writer, in a way, makes themselves 
susceptible to biography because they might quite often be putting their own selves quite on display in a in a work of fiction. Whereas a playwright like Stoppard, who is not a sort of autobiographical playwright in the way that someone like, oh, I don't know, John Osborne or David Hare might be described more as an autobiographical playwright. He doesn't do confession. He's distributing himself often very complicatedly between different points of view in a play. And one of my interesting tasks as a biographer was to try and sort of spot him in the plays. So performance, I think, is a very important thing for the biographer to take on board. Well, you, in fact, say that Virginia Woolf felt that lives never, they were never adequately reflected. That you may have, you know, you may have gotten six or seven, whereas, according to her, we have thousands. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think if you, if you think about your own life, if anybody thinks about their own life, there are obviously going to be compartments, there are going to be different areas, there are going to be different stages of one's life which you might look back on with some dismay or or incredulity that one could have lived one's life in a certain way at a certain time there are many many people who live double lives or who have mm-hmm. secrets and one of the difficulties about biography is those double lives or secrets or things that people didn't want known about it it raises the whole issue of the ethics of the genre and whether what you're doing is trawling through someone's history would have been horrified by by this. Um, and you have to either be ruthless about that or if you're going to be very tender about it, then you're probably in the wrong trade. But I, I do think she's right. I think Wolf is right about the numerous different kinds of ways in which a person leads their their life. I mean, we all can think of examples of it. And so that's a fascinating thing about biography, how how far you can go with that and how much you can access those different sides of a person's life. Well, we do want the real, the truthful dirt, don't we? Yeah, I think the I think the appetite for biography, and there's no indication for me that it's going away. I mean, people, you sometimes see headlines on yeah. the death of biography, like you used to, do you remember, on the death of the novel? <laughs> I don't think it's going away. I think we no, have no. just as much appetite as ever for reading about other people's lives. And I think it's very curiously, again, I think it's very curiously doubled. There are sort of low motives of yeah. wanting the gossip and feeling prurient and, and wanting to find out what they did in bed and hoping their clothes will come off during during the course of the, the biography. Is it a voyeuristic? It's yeah, a voyeuristic. probably. It's a low, low form of voyeurism. But it's really mixed up with other impulses, both in the reader and the writer, which I think go right back to the historic antecedents of biography, where you go back to the saints' lives in early Christian martyrs and also to the classical lives of Roman and Greek leaders, like in Plutarch, where, as Dryden said, you know, you, you see, you, you get inside the great man's private rooms and you see what they were really like, and that's part of the impulse. But the history of the sort of saint's life or the exemplary life, I think still stays on. If you read a life of someone like Nelson Mandela, part of your impulse is not a low motive to find out whether there are any nasty things that Nelson Mandela did in his life or whether he was any ever mean to someone. You want to read about this person's life because they are an inspirational, a great inspirational human being who affected mm-hmm. the course of history. And so you come to it with the motive of wanting to wanting to read more about how that exemplary life was shaped. And I think, you know, as with this sort of autopsy portrait thing that we started by talking about, I think there is also this real double motive that lies behind the popularity of biography. We want to read about lives that are like our own. We want to read about lives that are completely unlike our own. We want to read all the shame and the scurrilous stuff and all the wicked stuff so we can go have a big blast and say how appalling this person was. Nobody should read this book. This is terrible. And at the same time, we want to say, how did this great writer come to be doing the things that they were doing? I think it's very mixed. So why do we want to know dirt? 
Why is that such a driver? Well, it's the same as gossip, isn't it? If you're gossiping, you don't think about you don't think about the inner life of the person you're gossiping about. You don't think, how might this gossip injure this person? There's sort of there's often a Schadenfreude or envy or or jealousy of success. And when you're gossiping, you want a eye rolling story about their behaviour, which you can then take possession on of and repeat to other people. That makes you feel superior. Like yes, what? it gives you it gives you power. It gives you some kind of cultural power when you find these things out that you think not many people know. And so when you're reading a biography which is scurrilous or shameful or, or casts a poor light on a famous person who's been mm. a high-achieving person, there's something obscenely gratifying about it. So you think, oh, so that's what they were like. You know, we have very low natures, but those yeah. low natures are mixed with more valuable things like admiration and wonder. And I think it's very hard to to sort out, you know, where one stops and the other begins. It's like how journalism works. They build up mm. people and then they love tearing them down. Then what is it? It's a sort of sad reflection of how we perceive human nature to be. It's really not that great. And so... I think there's a lot about envy that people who are in, as it were, second rank trades... You know, I don't think a biography, for instance, as on a par with being a great playwright or a great musician or a, uh, a great composer or a great artist. I think biography... You think of yourself as a parasite? I don't think of myself as a parasite, but I don't think of myself as a sort of top-level creative artist in the way that I think Willa Cather is or Virginia Woolf is or Tom Stoppard is, actually. I do. I think I think you can do a very good job of work and you can be creative and you can be thoughtful and you can write a you can write a good and interesting book. But I don't think you're you're not pinning it out of yourself like the spider spinning its web in the way right. that a, po a poet is. And so I think if you're a journalist, you can be a very good journalist. But there might be some envy of the really the really fine top notch creative genius when you know you're not one yourself. I mean, this is all hypothesis. You know, there have been lots of attacks on biography, and I wrote about that in my little book. I had a chapter yes, called Against Biography, and there are some very famous all-out attacks on, on biographers like Janet Malcolm's wonderful all-out <laughs> scathing piece about biographers, and also Henry James, if you read the Aspen Papers, a very great short novel in which the biographer, the would-be biographer, is, is a publishing scoundrel um, and gets a terrible, has a bad fate at the end of the of the story. And, and uh, you know, Henry James and Edith Wharton, a lot of people at the end of the 19th century were deeply worried about the way in which the life of the author was becoming grist to the mill of publicists and journalists they didn't like it at all although i must also add henry james read biography with absolute fascination <laughs> yes <laughs> and he loved a good <laughs> gossip as much as anyone but uh, i i don't think you know i don't think a biography in the way janet malcolm thinks of biography in that in that piece about plath that book about plath where she talks about them as you know, the lowest form of human life, burglars, leeches, yeah. blunderers, you know, I don't think of it like that. I think it's a, a really serious attempt to understand, in my case, how a literary artist works and what sources in their life their work comes out of. But I do think of it ultimately as sort of second order creativity, not first order. Okay. What about tone? You you seem to think that's pretty important. It is, isn't it? You you can tell what kind of book you're going to be reading from the first page usually. And I quite like to, when I'm teaching biography, to look at the first pages of, mm -hmm. of different books. There's a question, for, first of all, about how chummy you're going to be. You know, are you going to call your subject by their first name? This is an interesting gender thing, by the way, that historically women subjects have often been called by their first now you wouldn't write a whole biography of dickens and call him charlie all the way through whereas people quite often write a biography of virginia wolf and call her virginia 
and uh, you know this is a this is a whole issue that it's I, I disrespect a lot. it's just, it's just one of those gender assumptions that is changing now i think i mean but also yeah. so for instance when i was writing my life of tom stopper of course i you know i knew him slightly when i started the book i got to know him much better through the work and you know, i think of him as a as a friend and i i would call him tom and he would in call me book? Hermione. No, that's my, exactly my point. In the yeah. book, I very, very deliberately didn't call him Tom, although, you know, in human life I would, because I thought that it made it sound too chummy. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to keep a kind of, yeah, that sense of distant formality. Uh, you know, I'm the biographer, he's the subject of the biography. It's, it's yeah. I think tone has a lot to do with naming and also has a lot to do with whether you decide to write in the past tense or the present tense. That historical present that people do, which is a sort of faux way of bringing you into the into the moment, I, I'm very dubious about. So what is it then about tone that would make a biography good or bad? You can't quite prescribe, but I think that there are we talked before about making it up, you know, all that he might have done, he would have done. Uh, surely this was the moment when when he looked back in later years, he realised that at this point his life had changed, you know. And there are those old tropes that you get of sort of, you know, his hair blown in the wind, the young man set out on his <laughs> life's journey. His name was <laughs> Shelley. You know, <laughs> dramatising. That people right. Do. Don't right. think they do it so much anymore. Yeah. Bringing yourself in a lot, saying I on every page. Of course, there are now different kinds of life writing being done, which is very interesting to me. I don't do it, but I'm very fascinated by it, where it's the relationship with the subject that is the subject of the book. So that, of course, people are saying I because they are actually writing, you know, a kind of a memoir of their own reading of Proust or whatever it is. That's not what I do, but I'm interested in other people. I think that tone of making things up, being falsely chummy, trying to dramatise things in ways which aren't quite, which are a little bit sensational, all those things I would want to watch out for. Speaking about men and women, you make a really interesting point about how women tend to be judged on their private lives and men on their public. Maybe I was a bit too schematic about that, but I do think that there is more of a tendency historically in biography to judge women such as have been biographized in terms of whether they were a you know a good wife and mother and all the right I mean it's here's a good case in point Doris Lessing left her children notably and you know went off and started another life that is an absolute key point whenever anyone is writing about Doris Lessing. My sense is that if a man of that era, a major, major writer of that era, had left their wife or partner to bring up their children while they forged their way as a great writer, probably not so much ink would have been spilt anathematizing that choice. Yeah, it's kind of moralizing, isn't it? I mean, it's very interesting, going back historically, I, I mentioned Elizabeth Gaskell's life of Charlotte Bronte. That's a very fascinating historical example because Bronte, once her cover had been blown and she was known as the woman author of Jane Eyre, there were a lot of attacks on her for crudeness and unfemininity and sort of, you know, shocking savagery and all the rest of it. And Gaskell, in order to put that record straight, concentrated on Bronte as a dutiful daughter and eventually a loving wife and as a good sister, you know, rather than or rather than on her as a great genius, which is what she was. So yeah. that's a historic, I mean, you wouldn't get that anymore, obviously, but that's a historical example of the way the scales have been weighted in biography, I think. Just winding down here. The tension between an obsessional commitment, which it seems to me you have to have, and detachment. Can you talk about that? Well, it's not a marriage. It's not a relationship. You're not writing about yourself, in my view. 
in the end, it's a job. You've got to amass the materials, get them in some sort of order, work out what's missing. That's often a very interesting part of the job. Decide what you're going to do about the gaps, whether you're going to admit to them, which I prefer to, or whether you're going to try and smooth them over. You've got to find a shape whereby you can tell the story as, as richly as possible. And you do all that, and it takes quite a long time. I'm one of the things about this, but I'm, I'm slow, partly because I've had a day job, that, you know, until recently at the same time. But my books take me five or six years to write. So that's a long commitment. And then you do it, and you send it out, and you start gradually thinking about the next thing you might be going to do. And at that point, you mustn't, seems to me, go on feeling possessive about that subject the subject doesn't belong to you you have as it were done your work with this subject and the point for me was to try and understand where their work came from and what kind of person created that work and then you must let them go and so I think I ended the book on the little book on biography by saying you know the way every biographer ends their job is to see the person they've been obsessed with as it were walking away from them into the silence of the past and then other people will pick up that journey and yeah. other people will, will write about them. And, you you know, it's a bad thing to think mine was the only version that should stand for posterity because it ain't so and it's never going to be so. I remember crying at the end of uh, Elman's Oscar Wilde. Hmm. That's a good book. It was such a, such a god-awful death, wasn't it? Hmm. Terrible ending. Terrible, yeah, heartbreaking like, uh, story. On all, on all levels. Mm. Is that what you'd want, someone to get that deeply moved by what you're writing? I'm quite moved when I get to the end of my books, partly because, uh, because I'm saying goodbye and it's a parting of the ways. But I suppose I'd rather the reader was left. I mean, I wouldn't mind if they shed a little tear as they come to the last page <laughs> because they're saying goodbye to the story, as it were. But I, I suppose what I hope is that the reader will, will have a sense of having been enriched by, as it were, the doors opening into a life which I consider to be a life of value, whatever the personal faults or failings or peccadilloes of the person, and those must not be swept under the carpet but just a just I wouldn't write I wouldn't spend five or six years of my life working on someone who I didn't whose work I didn't admire and so yes I hope that I hope that admiration is uh is catching yeah it's like a friendship though too isn't it I mean that friendship is so important in a person's life there definitely is something going on in that same realm I don't think it is quite like a friendship. As I said, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a complicated form of companionship where you're trying to enter into and understand as best you can another person's life. It's not quite like friendship. Think of the number of things we don't know about our friends. You know, the number of bits of your friend. If you go to, if you, you know, if you go to a memorial service for a friend, you will very often sit there thinking, gosh, I've known that person for 40 years and I didn't know that about them. You know, whereas the biographer's job is more to find out all those things. So it's not exactly like a friendship. No, I guess I was talking about the reader. Like, I... Oh, OK. Yes, I understand what you mean. I very much hope that to be the case. And when I'm thinking on the rare occasions where I do think about who is going to read this book, which is something I try not to think about too much. I hope it will be someone who has befriended the book, yes, who, who thinks of the book as a companion while they're reading it. And just finally, Richard Holmes thinks that following, physically following the subject of a biography is, it, it's important enough for him to, <laughs> to name a book after it. Mm. Very important book for, for the history of biography and one that I read often and and um, and use when I'm teaching biography, a book called Footsteps, Adventures of a Romantic Biographer. And there's a wonderful image in there, which is the broken bridge at Avignon. 
where he compares right. biography to going as far as you can to the edge of the broken bridge and on the other side of the broken bridge is the past and you never quite get there but you can get as far as you possibly can but then you know to walk towards that towards that other shore as it were now I love that book and I have also gone voyaging after my subjects as much as I possibly can and what has that given you oh actually huge amounts of interest and many stories uh, many I have many good memories of rather remarkable journeys that I've made in the footsteps of my subjects. And you understand if you see the house where they grew up or if you see the places that mattered terribly to them or the houses where they lived, I think it gives you an enormous insight. I've just co-edited a book called Lives of Houses, which came out of a conference at the uh, Centre for Life Writing that I founded, co-edited with Kate Kennedy. And we got a collection of essays and stories and poems and pictures about the houses that were important to people in their lives, uh, like Sibelius's house or um, the Disraeli's house or Edith Wharton's houses. And it was a wonderful book to put together because there was clearly very strong feeling around the places people lived in and how much that could tell you about the lives they had lived. You talk about insights. So what insights? How big their room was when they were a child, how much privacy they had to get away from the rest of the family, why they might have wanted to leave, what they took from the landscape outside their bedroom window, how they had furnished their rooms and what of that was left, whether they were interested in gardens and the outside world, and if so, whether any of their garden gardening designs uh, were left, how much they were in contact with the people who lived in the houses around them. It's endless. It's endless insights. Yes, but but how does that help you write their life? Like, because it makes you understand where they come from and how they function and what kind of person they are. Uh, not everything about them, but you will learn an enormous amount um, from finding out the nature and the kind of place that they lived in or, you know, serially lived in over the course of their lives. Well, thank you very much for an interesting conversation. Yes, great pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.